I'll speak to you today uh, about corruption in three parts. First, I'll define what is corruption because there is a lot of loose talk about what is corruption. Uh, and that the word is used quite loosely even to cover uh, bribe, uh, uh, extortion, fraud, cheating, and all that. The second part I'll deal with why is corruption bad for the country? It's a multi-dimensional effect on the country. And finally, I'll briefly describe how we can cure ourselves, both in the short run and in the long run, of corruption. What is required to finish off corruption, make it into a, uh, you can always have a uh, little, uh, little corruption, you can't eliminate 100%, doesn't matter. But in terms of these mega corruptions, they won't take place anymore. Um, the, the, the corruption that I think is of most, most relevance for our discussion today is when a public office is misused for private gain. Private gain for yourself, private gain for somebody else, private gain for your family, or all, all of them together. The word is used quite loosely recently. Uh, the Congress General Secretary, Mr. DPJ Singh, said that now there is corrupt because he accepts cash, which is black money. Of course, TBJ is an expert, he can look at a ruby note and tell that it's black or white. <laughs> but uh, that is not corruption. Because Ramdev accepts money. He has not misused any public office to receive that money. Suppose I carry, I'm a corrupt person and I carry uh, cash in my pocket. And I go uh, a taxi. And I then pay the taxi. Uh, driver in cash. Now the uh, taxi driver is not corrupt merely because he's accepted that uh, cash. So therefore we must be very strict. Take this while from the now it's now it's okay. Now it's not I think okay. it's not out this one. Yeah, it does it again. So therefore we must but, uh, within that framework of looking at public office and decide whether the public office is being used. By that definition, the Transparency International places our country today at the 87th uh, uh, number in the, uh, the list of countries in the increase, decreasing uh, descending order of cleanliness. The most clean nations are like New Zealand and Finland and so on. But uh, the, uh, uh, the most corrupt nations are to the bottom. Uh, China is a little above us. Uh, it's about 74. China is also a very corrupt country. Uh, of course, in the case of China, we don't know the extent of that corruption. Because it's not a free society like ours. We have a full-fledged regional office of the Transparency International in New Delhi which has freedom to go and find out, interview people and say examples so of it. In China, there is no independent office of Transparency International. There is an NGO which functions inside the Tsinghua University campus uh, under great uh, personal threats. And uh, that's how it, uh, they are able to get some data. When India started websites, a lot of Indian when people started starting websites, I paid a bribe on the website started becoming popular. A lot of people who paid bribes then said I was supposed to pay a bribe. And they, in these things were reported. In China, this was imitated by some people. But then Chinese government moved in and closed down these sites. So still, I would say that uh, broadly speaking, India and China, I have about the same level of corruption. And it's not a very uh, good number to be in considering that you want to be global powers. So that's the first thing I would like to say, that there's a misuse of public office. Then it is corruption. In 
the Setu Samudram, the office of the uh, shipping ministry was misused to create a project. A project was what to dig a canal on the ocean floor in the Park Strait and the Gulf of Mannar so that ships, instead of going around Sri Lanka, uh, if, when they come in from, say, Aden uh, or from Africa, they have to go around Sri Lanka to go to Chennai. So instead of that, if a ship docks in, say, Tutikore and then wants to go to Chennai, it should not have to go around Sri Lanka. So it was decided that it would, they would dig a canal which would go through Chennai and then on to Kanka. Now, uh, the reason uh, they had to dig a canal on the ocean floor was that uh, uh, the, uh, the, the floor was too shallow. I mean, the water level was not enough. So if you bring a ship, it would sink into the ground, hit the ground, and therefore you had to build a, uh, dig the uh, canal on the ground. Now, this project, first of all, was objected to me by me in the Supreme Court on the grounds that the way this canal was drawn up was deliberately to cut through Ramasetu. Ramasetu is not across from the Indian coast to the Sri Lanka coast. Ra from the Indian coast to the middle of the Park Strait is an island called Rameshwaram Island, where you get uh, where Rameshwaram, uh, where the temple of Rameshwaram is. It ends in Dhanushkodi. And Dhanushkodi is where Ra did his puja, asking the, uh, the waves, uh, the water waves to part. He prayed to the Samudra Raja saying, please part the waves. This one. But uh, they, 
they wanted deliberately to cut through. And uh, Karnalidhi used to tell the Muslims that the, the Hindus broke Ram Ramsey Masjid, I will break Ram Sethi. Well, so that's why they chose this route. I urged them in the beginning, you, you take another route. But then uh, they insisted on this route. I went to court, but not on the grounds that Rama Sethi was being cut, but on the ground that the economic analysis shows that there is corruption in this project. And what is the corruption? First of all, uh, when, when you have only uh, 11 foot depth of the canal, only ships which are less uh, freight status of less than 35,000 uh, tons can go through. No other ship uh, of heavier weight can go. In the world, freight ships, only 5% are uh, for freight, uh, uh, for a freight capacity of less than 35,000. Most of them are now in 100,000 class. So what is 5%? It turned out that the shipping minister's son had a trawler company with whose ships are all less than 35,000. <laughs> <laughs> so it was to facilitate uh, Second thing is that uh, the uh, because it is not like Suez Canal where you are cutting through land, it was through uh, underwater. So the ocean would go on putting sand back. So every day, every week, you had to dredge the sand out to clear the way. And that was a thousand crore project per year. And that project of dredging was given to. Mr. Tia Baru was the shipping minister's second wife. Most of the DMK people have more than one wife. So <laughs> they consider that their status symbol. And, uh, and his second wife's son also uh, had to be given a contract. So he was given the judging contract. <laughs> so I showed that, uh, that you know, it's not economically uh, feasible. In fact, it was a cheaper project. Come to Tuti Bhavet, build that as a modern container port. Put a railway line from along the coast all the way to Calcutta, and uh, from the uh, harbor, uh, the containers can be picked up by the train and taken, and it's much cheaper. I showed that calculation. And uh, in the end, also, <laughs> so in the end, also, I also said about Ram Sethu because there is a section in, uh, in our Indian Penal Code which says that anything sacred held to be sacred by the people, by a very substantial number of people, cannot be damaged without incurring a criminal offence, without creating, without uh, committing a criminal offence. That's section 295 of the IPC. So I quoted that to the judge, in the, to before the Supreme Court judges, and the, at that time the Chief Justice of Balakrishnan, he asked me, are you saying that you will find a case against uh, me on this, I said not yet because you have not yet ordered dismissal of my petition. <laughs> if you order dismissal of my petition and then allow the Ram Sen to be cut, then I will say that you are also a party to this in the final case. Uh, I'm happy to say that he gave me a stay and uh, ordered the government to find another route without cutting through the Ram Sen. <laughs>